It's the summer of 1953, eight years after the end of the Second World War, and two vastly opposing topics of interest are jostling for the headlines of the national newspapers all across Great Britain. There is the impending coronation of the recently ascended Queen Elizabeth, and for the first time in a long while, the country has something to celebrate. The red, white and blue bunting, packed away after the VE Day celebrations in 1945, is now draped across the streets and from lampposts, and the mood of the nation is buoyed by the sight of the young Queen thrust into the role following the sudden death of her father, the late King George VI, a year earlier. Competing for front page headlines though, are the horrors of Rillington Place, Notting Hill, and the impending trial of serial killer John Reginald Halliday Christie, and also the callous poisoning by Louisa Merrifield in the seaside resort of Blackpool in the northwest of England a few weeks earlier. There was hope that the forthcoming coronation would mark a new dawn for the country, with the economy on the up and with the post-war austerity and rationing gradually coming to an end. Sunday the 31st of May had been a gloriously sunny day, and with a gentle breeze and blue skies, it was a perfect day for a picnic. Petersham Meadows, just off the Thames footpath at Teddington Lock near Richmond in south-west London, was a perfect place for camping. Surrounded by a thick line of trees and with water-filled gravel pits ideal for paddling and cooling off from the heat, the field had been full of campers for most of the weekend. Amongst those with tents pitched in the meadow were three young men, 21-year-old John Wells, 18-year-old Albert Sparks and Peter Warren, aged 20. Two days earlier, Wells had bumped into Christine Reed at a local coffee bar and invited her and her friend Barbara Songus to join them for a picnic at the camp. 18-year-old Christine worked as a chemist's assistant and lived a few doors away from Wells on Roy Grove in Hampton Hill and agreed to join them on Sunday. On Saturday evening, Barbara and Christine went to a dance at York Hall Twickenham and shortly after midnight, they cycled the two miles home. And as she had done many times before, 16-year-old Barbara stayed over at her friend's house. After breakfast on Sunday morning, the girls set off on their bikes to meet up with the boys at the campsite. They stayed until early afternoon when they returned to Christine's home for lunch. Finishing their meal, the girls got back on their bicycles and rejoined the boys at the camp. They stayed until around 11pm when they bid goodnight and cycled away in the direction of Kingston Bridge. They never returned home. At 8am on the following morning, George Costa, a foreman for the Port of London Authority, was one of a gang working on some repairs to a riverbank at Radnor Gardens, a mile north of Teddington Lock, opposite St Catherine's School, when he spotted something floating in the shallow water. He first noticed a grubby coat, then the unmistakable body of a young girl. Costa rushed to telephone the police and an officer was soon dispatched to the scene. A short time later, a police surgeon certified the girl dead. From the extent of her injuries, severe lacerations to the head and what appeared to be stab wounds and blood stains on the jacket, it seemed clear that she had died as a result of foul play. The police already had a possible name for the young girl. Christine Reed's parents had contacted Barbara's when the girls failed to return home on the previous evening. Finding they hadn't returned to either house and not being the kind of girls that would stay out without first informing their parents, Barbara's mother contacted the police. A short time later, at Richmond Hospital Mortuary, Gertrude Songus confirmed that the clothes and brooch pin on the body matched those of her daughter Barbara. Once Barbara's body had been identified, it was confirmed that her friend, Christine Reed, was also missing. Detective Superintendent Herbert Hannon and Sergeant Harold Hudson from Scotland Yard were put in charge of the investigation and immediately launched a detailed search of the area. About a mile from where the body was found, they discovered a patch of blood on the path. From it, drag marks led to the river. Nearby was a pair of girls' shoes. Then they found another patch of blood on the path and some nearby grass, but no further clues. Shortly afternoon, in the presence of both detectives, pathologist Arthur Mance carried out the autopsy on 16-year-old Barbara Songust. He found that she had been savagely attacked before death and had been in the water for approximately 9 to 10 hours. There was a deep semicircular wound on the left cheek which had fractured and was consistent with a blow from a sharp axe blade. On her scalp were a number of crushing lacerations and there were also three stab wounds in the back of the chest, inflicted with a sharp instrument, possibly a double-edged stiletto type knife. He also confirmed that Barbara had been a virgin before the killer had assaulted and violated her. Superintendent Hannon learned that the two girls had spent the Saturday at the camp with the three youths and immediately questioned them. John Wells told police the girls had left and cycled away along the towpath at about 11pm. 
The young men had amongst their possession a number of knives and an axe, and as they were the last people reported to have seen the girls alive, this initially made them their prime suspects. The axe was examined and found not to be similar in shape to the one that had caused the wounds on Barbara's head, and none of the knives had blades that matched the stab wounds. All three denied having sex with the girls, although Albert Sparks admitted that he and Christine had kissed a number of times throughout the day in his tent. A man sitting with his girlfriend close to the river, a few hundred yards down from the camp, said he'd heard the girls cycle past at about 11.30, and this seemed to pinpoint the time of the murder as shortly before midnight. The police began looking for a man who owned an axe and a stiletto knife, and who could not account for his movements between 11pm and midnight on the 31st of May. They also believed his clothes would be bloodstained. Despite a thorough search along the towpath, Christine Reed remained missing for several days. Superintendent Hannon and his team scoured the riverbed for clues using powerful underwater telescopes as large crowds congregated on the towpath to watch. The search along the riverbank was gradually widened with hundreds of officers combing the area, collecting witness statements, questioning young men about their whereabouts on the Sunday night. A day later, a second pair of shoes was found in the undergrowth and identified as Christine's. Then her bicycle was dragged from the river before her body was finally discovered on Saturday the 6th of June. This was now a double murder inquiry as Christine had suffered similar injuries and stab wounds and had also been sexually assaulted around the time of her death. Despite detectives continuing to question hundreds of young men in the area, their investigations thus far failed to turn up any likely suspects. Prior to the double murder at Teddington, there had been a recent spate of attacks on lone females in and around the Surrey area. At 10.30 on Whit Sunday morning, the 24th of May, a week before the murders, 14-year-old Kathleen Ringham was out walking her dog on Oxshot Common near Leatherhead when she was attacked and sexually assaulted. Taken to Kingston Hospital, she had several stitches put in a head wound, but despite being bloodied and traumatised, she was able to give detectives a good description of her assailant when she described the attack. I saw a man on a blue bike with a blue shirt go by. As I got to an isolated path, I heard a bicycle behind me. I felt a blow on the back of my head. I was dazed and dragged into the bushes. He said it would be all right that he was going to do me. He asked me how old I was. I said I was 14. I did not scream as it was a lonely spot and I was worried he would put his hands around my throat again. She described him as wearing brown gloves and crepe sole shoes, having a spotty face and riding a blue bicycle with a black saddlebag. She said he was also carrying a large yellow and black axe. Then, 12 days after the murder of the two girls, on Friday the 12th of June, 56-year-old Patricia Birch was exercising her dogs in Windsor Great Park when she was attacked by a man. She said he had dismounted from his bicycle and asked her way to the holly tree. As she turned to point, she felt a hand on her mouth, then another hand grabbed her throat. As she cried out, he put his forearm under her chin, pressing her and telling her to keep quiet. Just come into the bushes and I won't hurt you, he told the terrified woman. She managed to break away and shouted for help when he grabbed her again. I told you to be quiet. It's too late now, lady, he growled, tightening the grip. I'm 56 now, just had a serious operation, she pleaded. Give us a little kiss then, he retorted. I'll give you my purse. I'll give you everything I have with me, she said, offering the money. He snatched it and, ordering her not to tell anyone, warned, I have a knife and know how to throw it, as he mounted his bicycle and cycled away. Patricia Birch gave the police a detailed description of the attacker. The description was startlingly similar to that of the Oxshot Common Assault, and as a result, police arranged for extra patrols in both of these areas. On Wednesday the 17th of June, two police officers saw a man at Oxshot Common acting suspiciously. His description matched that of the suspect wanted for both assaults. The man gave his name as 22-year-old Alfred Charles Whiteway. PCs Arthur Oliver and Charles Howard questioned the man and told him he was being taken back to the station for further questioning. Whiteway wasn't searched before being placed in the back of the car as the two officers climbed into the front seats. Whiteway leaned forward to speak to the officers, asking questions about the car and the police radio. Whilst unbeknown to them, he slipped the axe he had concealed under his jacket onto the floor of the car and using his foot eased it under the driver's seat. Taken to Kingston Police Station, he was searched and questioned about his movements. Asked to empty his pockets, the officers found 10 shillings and two bike clips, although he wasn't riding a bike when questioned. Satisfied with his account that he was just out walking in the park, he was allowed to leave. 
There then occurred one of the most bizarre incidents in a 20th century murder investigation. On the following morning, PC Arthur Koch was cleaning out a patrol car prior to going on duty when he spotted an axe under the driver's seat. It was seemingly custom at this station for officers who found lost property to stash it in their locker and if it remained unclaimed, for the finder to keep it. Unaware of the link with the assaults, PC Koch put the axe in his locker then went about his duties. On the following day he went off sick and was absent for five days. On his return he took the axe home, put it in his toolbox and used it a number of times to chop wood for his fire. A few days after being released, Alfred Whiteway was brought back into custody for further questioning regarding the attacks on Patricia Birch and Kathleen Ringham. Placed in an identity parade, he was picked out by both of them. Whiteway was then arrested and charged with both assaults. I am the person who attacked the old woman, I want to get it squared up, he confessed, and admitted the sexual assault on the young girl. With Whiteway in custody, police suspected they may have also got the towpath murderer, and Detective Superintendent Hannon hurried to Kingston to question him about his movements on the night of the 31st of May. I guess this would come before long, Whiteway said. It looks like me, I grant you, but when that job was done, I was with my wife at home. Asked if he knew where the girls were murdered, Whiteway was alleged to have replied, I'm going to keep my mouth shut or you'll pin it on me. I had nothing to do with the girls. You're wasting your time. The bloke that did that job is mad. Although Whiteway had an alibi, he admitted that he knew Barbara Songhurst and that they had grown up together in the same part of Teddington, but said he hadn't seen her for many years. Whiteway told the superintendent about his home life and that he was married with two young children, but that he and his wife lived apart as they waited for a house. He was living at his parents' home in Teddington, where he shared a room with an elderly uncle. Although currently not living together, he said he saw his wife every evening. Asked about the knife, Whiteway said he collected them but only had one at the present time, a sheath knife. He said in May he had been practicing throwing knives at a tree near the river when he was joined by another man, Roy Turp, a school teacher. I can throw a chopper at trees, in fact I can throw it better than I do knives. Sometimes I take my mother's chopper in my saddlebag when I go throwing. I remember quite clearly taking the chopper back in my saddlebag and putting it back in the cupboard. As far as I know it's still in the house. I did not go up the towpath that night, I know nothing about the murders of Barbara Songhurst or Christine Reed. During the questioning, Whiteway confessed to the police how he'd hidden the axe used to scare the two women in a police car. An enraged Superintendent Hannon questioned all the officers at Kingston and a very sheepish and severely reprimanded PC Kosh returned it to the station. Whiteway was shown the axe. Blimey, that's it, it's been buggered about. It was bloody shirt when I had it. I sharpened it with a file. Shown a knife they said they had found in the river, he said, that's it, you got it out of the water, didn't you? On the 30th of July, Whiteway was again questioned about the towpath murders. He was interviewed in Brixton Prison, where he was on remand for the two cases of assault. Annan told him he now had the axe, a knife, and they had found traces of blood on his shoes. Unaware that the axe was now inadmissible as evidence due to it being tainted by the officer tampering with it, and also unaware that the minute traces of blood on his shoes were too small to clearly identify as human blood, Whiteway cracked. Were you kidding about the blood on my shoe? Superintendent Hannan said he wasn't. Whiteway turned pale and began to tremble. You know bloody well it was me. I didn't mean to kill him. I never wanted to hurt anyone. He then said, it's all up, you know bloody well I done it. That shoe bugging me, what a bloody mess, I'm mental. My head must be wrong, I must have a bloody woman, I can't stop myself. I'm not a bloody murderer, block them yes every time but not kill them. I only see one girl, she came round the tree where I stood and I bashed her, no harder than the other kid and she went down like a log. Then the other screamed out down by the lock. Never saw her till then I didn't. I nipped over and shut her up, two of them. And then I tumbled the other one knew me. If it hadn't been for that, it wouldn't have happened. Put that bloody chopper away, it aren't you? Why don't the doctors do something? I cannot stop it. Once you tell you sod's a bloody lie, you're buggered forever. Give us it, I'll sign it. Hannon then said that the murder weapon had not yet been found, to which Whiteway cursed. So you have done it on me. I shall say it's all lies then, like the blood. Despite now claiming to retract his confession, Alfred Whiteway was charged with willful murder and returned to his cell. There will be several remand hearings over the summer as evidence was gathered in readiness for Whiteway's trial for murder in the autumn.
tried before Mr Justice Hilbury at the Old Bailey on the 26th of October 1953, Whiteway was charged just on one count of murder, that of Barbara Songhurst. This was usual in cases of multiple murders, but while he was only being charged with the one offence, evidence would be heard in relation to both attacks. Mr Christmas Humphreys QC led for the prosecution, while Mr Peter Rawlinson QC appeared for the defence. Presenting the case to the jury, Christmas Humphreys pointed out that it was not part of the case for the Crown to prove motive. Barbara Songus may have recognised her assailant and he had then killed her to silence her. He said that an axe that caused injuries to these two girls was not only found in the possession of the accused, but was found in circumstances in which it was obvious he was trying to conceal it. Also, a long-bladed knife had been seen in Whiteway's possession a few days before by the school teacher. The unfortunate PC Kosh told how he'd found the axe in the car and had taken it home. Asked why did he put it away in his locker and not report it, he claimed it was practice among drivers that anything found in the car is claimed by the driver finding it. Mr Justice Hilbury then retorted, You're not suggesting that if a man leaves a jemmy in the car, the officer claims that, are you? No, sir, mumbled the shamefaced officer. Schoolmaster Roy Turp gave evidence that one Sunday morning, shortly before the murders, he saw Whiteway throwing a knife at a tree and recognised the Gurkha knife exhibited in the court. Whiteway's sister was handed the axe and asked if she recognised it. She looked at it for about 30 seconds amidst dead silence in court, then replied, We did have one like this, sir. It went missing a few weeks before the police came to see me. She also claimed her brother habitually carried a knife. Whiteway's shoe was produced in court and Dr Lewis Nichols, head of the Forensic Laboratory at Scotland Yard, said he had found a strong reaction for blood around the sewing near the lace tanks and around the outer edge of the junction of the sole and the upper. He said he had taken the shoe to pieces and identified the presence of human blood. Whiteway's 18-year-old wife Nelly told the court she was with him on the night of the murder but they had parted shortly after 11.30 and she did not see in which direction he headed after leaving her house. Whiteway's alibi that he was home at the time of the attacks was obviously a shaky one. His uncle, Charles Langston, said he remembered his nephew coming home that night at about 11.30 by a clock which was about 10 to 15 minutes slow. Before Whiteway's confession was read, the judge overruled a submission by the defence that the statements taken from him were inadmissible. Superintendent Hannon denied that he had manufactured Whiteway's alleged statement. Defence counsel Rawlinson told the detective, I suggest that the confession is a statement manufactured by you. That is absolutely untrue. I repeat the suggestion that the statement was invented by you. I repeat it is a shocking suggestion and I am pleased to deny it. The prosecution asked the police officer, was it obvious that this was the confession of murder? It was. And you took it down as he said it? I did. Whiteway told that we hid the axe in the police car when he was taken to Kingston Police Station on the 17th of June. Did you leave your axe in that car? Yes. Was it in connection with another offence? Yes, it was. Regarding the alleged statement, Whiteway was asked, You agree that if you made that statement, it is confession of murder, isn't it? It is. You are alleging that these two officers forged that statement and committed perjury in putting you before the jury. I am saying I never said it. The prosecution sought to call Kathleen Ringham to give evidence regarding her attack at Oxshot, but her evidence was disallowed. The prosecution had hoped to establish a similarity between the attack on her with an axe and the attack on the two girls on the towpath who had also been violently assaulted after being rendered unconscious with a blow from an axe. In his final speech to the jury, defence counsel said, Nobody knows exactly what happened to these two girls. It may be those two girls stayed out with those campers a little longer and did not get to this tree until well after midnight. It may be those bodies did not become bodies until much later, in which case Whiteway was back at home as he had been since 5 to 12. Rawlinson pointed out that if the case rested without a confession that Whiteway claim was made up, then there would almost certainly be an acquittal. If Whiteway never made that statement, as he says he never made it, the only explanation is that statement was fabricated by someone and it is suggested that his signature was put on it by means of a trick. They also mentioned the lack of any blood found on his clothes, other than traces on one shoe. There were 19 wounds on Christine Reed and at least seven on Barbara Songhurst, yet there was no blood on this man. In the final speech for the prosecution, Christmas Humphreys referred to the accusation that the police had invented Whiteway's confession as the most tremendous attack ever made in that court. The prosecution, Humphreys said, were satisfied of Whiteway's guilt even without his confession. Do you believe, he asked the jury, that any officer would be so fantastically murderous as to forfeit the whole of his career by plain willful forgery? 
and feral murderous perjury against an innocent man as to write out this statement and fake and fooling him into signing it. On the fifth day of the trial, the jury of ten men and two women found Alfred Whiteway guilty of murder after just 50 minute deliberation. The black cap was draped on his wig and Mr Justice Hilbury sentenced Alfred Whiteway to be hanged by the neck until dead. It was ordered that the indictment for the murder of Christine Reed and the two other indictments alleging rape and attempted rape against two different women should remain on file. He was then removed from the court and taken to the condemned cell at Wandsworth Prison. In dismissing Whiteway's appeal on the 7th of December, Lord Goddard claimed that this was one of the most brutal and horrifying he'd ever seen before this court and any other court for years. It is just as well that the public should know that this man was arrested for attempted rape in Windsor Park and the dreadful assault on a girl of 14 at Oxshot. This was the conduct of the man who was convicted of the ghastly murder on the towpath. Shortly before his execution, Whiteway sent the detective a handwritten note from prison. Mr Hannon, you were wrong. Why you made up that false confession, I can't say, but you knew your word would be more accepted than mine. I played into your hands too easily. You were so positive that it was me that you risked a lot to have me hanged. Well, you were successful. A second letter written to his mother read, I'll tell you this, Ma, I've done some rotten things in my life, but this time they are wrong. I never did it, but I reckon I deserve to die for that Oxshot affair. At nine o'clock on Tuesday the 22nd of December, Alfred Whiteway was hanged at Wandsworth by Albert Pierpoint and new assistant Joe Broadbent, participating in just his second execution. A crowd of less than 50 waited at the prison gates for notice to be posted that the towpath Tarzan had paid the ultimate penalty. PC Arthur Kosh was severely reprimanded by the Police Disciplinary Board. He wasn't dismissed but was fined four days pay and returned to normal duties. In debating capital punishment, it could be argued that seldom has a death penalty been more justified than in the case of Alfred Whiteway. Yet the fact he knew that death was a penalty for murder, this did not deter him. Was he mad? He claimed when arrested he had uncontrollable sexual impulses, but does that excuse murder? Did Detective Superintendent Bert Hannon lie in court? There has since been a number of capital cases from the 1950s where the integrity of the officers in charge has been questioned, leading to convictions being quashed and overturned in appeal courts many years later. Hannon later said that detectives should do anything to secure a conviction if he believed a man was guilty. Was Whiteway's confession faked? Unlikely, but we shall never know. Would Whiteway have been convicted had he not confessed? Without it, there was strong circumstantial evidence against him, evidence that had left his guilt in doubt. He was a rapist and attacker of women, although that could not be shown to the jury. He also owned an axe and had tried to conceal it. He had possessed a long-bladed knife similar to the one used by the murderer. His shoe was bloodstained. He knew the area well and had been in the vicinity at the time of the crime. His alibi was doubtful, but above all, he had a motive for murder, for Barbara Songers knew him. Having attacked her, it was her life or his liberty. Fear of discovery led Whiteway to murder both Barbara and Christine side by side. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode in Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like and share this video and if you don't already, can you please subscribe to the channel to keep up with new content. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find information on all my books, links to other videos in this series, and also order copies of the three-volume hardback book, The Hangman's Record, at a special discount price. On sale now is my latest book, Tales from the Hangman's Record, available as a paperback and Kindle download from Amazon. Also look out for two new podcasts, Tales from the Hangman's Record and Mostly Murder, available on Spotify and all popular platforms. Finally, please use the comments below for your thoughts on this video and suggestions for further episodes in this series. Mm -hmm.